Hi guys, Pepper Brown here once again. And today's lesson is just a basic notation uh, musical staff lesson that a lot of guys are missing out, a lot of uh, data. Like a lot of guys take classes in, in school on music theory and a lot of the teachers are fairly adequate but a lot of them really skip over stuff that uh, is really sorely lacking in a lot of people and that's what I hope to convey in this lesson is to cover the basics where you guys don't have any missing gaps in your knowledge. Uh, there really are quite a lot of people out there who have some drastically uh, poor skills as far as writing music. And this is just a basic, basic notation lesson that uh, I'm going to cover some of these uh, notation basics for you guys. And uh, hopefully this will help you out uh, so you can continue on in your music career. Okay, as you know, the musical staff is the five lines and four spaces, okay? So, the lines are right here. These are the lines. Here's a line here. Okay, the next line is right here. That's the first line, second line. Here's the third line. Here's the fourth line and the fifth line. So it's five lines right there, okay? Now, in between the lines, we have what are called the spaces. We've got the first space, second space, third space, and fourth space, right? Okay, the lines and the spaces are what we base everything on when we're writing music. The lines, the notes on the lines are E, G, B, D, and F. And of course you guys know the old sentence, every good boy does fine. That's how we remember that. Every good boy does fine. And on the spaces, it spells the word face. It's F-A-C-E. Are you with me on that? The word face. Okay, so we've got the lines are E, G, B, D, F, and the spaces are F, A, C, E. So together, what we've got is this. We've got E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay. Narrow that down a little bit. So we've got E down here, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so that's the lines and the spaces together, right? Now, music follows an alphabetical formula. If you were to write music out, it starts on A, the next note's B, it's there's B, C, D, E, F, G, and it starts over again at A. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, a, right? There's a two octave alphabetical scale. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's how we write our system of music, uh, traditional harmony. And you'll see on the lines and spaces, it was E, G, B, D, F, right? So we're doing E, G, B, D, F, right? What do you notice about that? That's every other note in the alphabetical order, isn't it? So it's every other note. And what if you notice that if you get to F, if you kept going and writing out the notes alphabetically, A, B, C, D, E, F, right? G, A, B, and so on. If you start on the word, on the note F, and you go every other note, aha! You got F A C E, right? So 
the lines are going to be E, G, B, D, F. But the spaces are going to be F, A, C, E, right? You see how that works now? But I can continue on with more lines. I can go A, C, E, G, B, D, F. Likewise with the spaces, I can go F, A, C, E, G, B, D, F. In other words, the pattern is always going to be F, A, C, E, G, B, D, F, A, C, E, G, B, D, F, A, C, E. Right? And you start over every octave, right? F A C E G B D F A C E G right but the lines are gonna be also the same thing aren't they E G B D F E G B D F and so on does that make sense to you guys okay so we have a continuum going on here. so what we have here are the lines here we got E right G, B, D, and F. But it keeps going. But how do we keep going? We have to write what are called ledger lines. And ledger line is the logical extension of the staff. Here's the last line. The next line up would be a ledger line. And we space it just like the other lines here, spaced evenly. So E, G, B, D, F, right? A, two ledger lines, C, three ledger lines E four ledger lines G right so we've got E G B D F A C right E G we can keep going I've rarely seen music with five ledger lines. Some violin music I've seen has it, but for the most part, uh, we try to stay within a minimal amount of ledger lines because it's harder to read. The lower ledger lines are, the, are similar. You can have E here, right? Here's an E. Uh, the next space below the line would be D. And then the ledger line below that would be C, right? And then the space below C would be B, and the space below and the line below B would be A. And that's two ledger lines. Three ledger lines. Actually, a space below the ledger line would be G, and then three ledger lines would be F. And the space below three ledger lines would be E. So that's your open E string. There's your open A string. There's your third fret G. There's your first fret F, right? Okay. For all you drop tuning freaks, you want to drop down to a low D. So you go four ledger lines to D. Okay. Drop C, guys, even more down to C, right? Okay, you can have a seven string guitar with five ledger lines down. It's an open B on the seventh string. Now, you see how it gets to be unwieldy having it that low? There's two things you can do, right? You can write the B right there and write eight V. B, right? Or you can use the bass clef and this would be the B right here. Here's a F, A, and there's a B right there. In the bass clef. Uh, to write a note above the line, 
we would create what's called a ledger line and they're evenly spaced so this line is a distance to that line is a space that line that line that line so the next ledger line above is going to be the same space and you try to get it as close as you can as accurate as you can you know with just by eye you know and then you write a note on the line or if you want to write it above the line like that uh, below the line you don't really do that because this is the lower line here, the F. So you'd write that note like that. So that's not good, right? Okay. So you'd write a ledger line. Here's the first ledger line. Two ledger lines. Three ledger lines. Four ledger lines. And I've occasionally seen in some music five ledger lines. Uh, although, you know, guys like Steve I can write stuff with six, seven ledger lines if he feels like it. Okay, so we got the ledger lines. Now, what are the ledger lines? How, how, do they, how are they represented? Well, if you have a scale that goes up like this, and the notes are in the lines are E, G, B, D, F, A, C, E, G are the ledger, line, are the ledger lines. They follow the same format, every other note in the scale, E, G, B, D, F, A, C, E, G. Now, if you wanted to write uh, this G up here, right, you could. However, a lot of times composers write the G right there, and they write 8, V, E, 8, V, A, excuse me, octave above, octave above, 8, octave above. Okay, octave above. Octave below is written 8VB, right? Octave below is octave 8B for below. Well, let's go over that again. If you write a note here, what is that? E, G, B, D, F, A, C, E, G. That's a G, right? Sometimes it's a little unwieldy to write a whole bunch of them up there. So they'll write the G here and just write 8, V, A. That means octave above. Okay. If you write this note here, The G there. Sometimes they'll write the note here instead, the G there, and write 8VB. That's octave below. Okay, so sometimes composers write the notes in that notation and they write 8VA. And you'll see that in a lot of classical guitar music. And sometimes they write this note up here on the staff and they write 8VB. That's standardized notation been around for four, five, six hundred years, okay? So we've got the notes on the staff. So we've got E, together, the lines and the spaces, we got E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then one space above the staff is an OG. So on below the staff, what we got is this. We got E, one space below the staff is D, one line below the staff is C, and that is called middle C. That's middle C. One space below that C is the note B. Two ledger lines is the note A. A space below that ledger line is the note G, which is the third fret on the E string. That's the G. That's the third fret on the E string. You see that a lot in classical guitar music. That note's used a lot. That's an easy note to read. Two lines and a space. Very easy to comprehend by the player. Okay. Three lines is a note F. That's also very easy to comprehend. Three lines you can't miss. Now, here we get into the E string. Three ledger lines in a space is the open E string, right? And then for you drop tuning guys, 
four ledger lines. That's a drop D. And if you want to keep going, there's four ledger lines and a space. It's a drop C. And if you want to keep going further, five ledger lines is what? One, two, three, four, five. That's a B, right? That's the lowest note on the seventh string guitar. So that's the low, the lowest note on the seventh string. That's the B. But a lot of times when you get that low, these ledger lines also become unwieldy, right? So you can do two things. You can do, if you have a ledger line that's too low, you can write the note up here, B right there, and go 8 VB, right? Octave below. So you play it an octave below where it's written. Or the next thing you can do is you use the bass clef, and that bass clef note would be a B right here. So it's really easy to see in the bass clef. It's a B. And this is a B right there. Okay. So a lot of times seven string guitar branches out into using the bass clef because the notes are so low. And the seven string, these guys drop tune the seven strings down. They drop routinely drop the B down to an A. So on the bass clef, that A would be right here, right? On the on the seven string guitar. Um, you could also uh, play in the treble clef this A here and write 8VB. That's one way to do it. There's two ways to do it. Um, the notation on the staff for the guitar is an octave away from the piano. In other words, um, this C on the piano is not that third fret on the guitar, on the A string. It's this note here on the, on the guitar. Okay, so that's on the second string first fret, C, second string, first fret. Can you guys find that for me? All right, so the piano and the guitar are written an octave apart notation-wise. That sound on the piano is that sound on the guitar, or the way they are written. Does that help out, you guys? Okay, now, so these are the way you write the notes. Okay, now, next subject, we're going to cover how to actually draw the notes. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at how you draw the notes on the staff. Uh, keep in mind that you want to be as accurate as you can. Uh, the best way to draw the notes is to follow this sort of line that goes at an angle like that. If you draw a line like that, that's kind of how you want to sketch in your notes. Like, in other words, you're not going to draw them this way. You're going to draw them more that way. So you have uh, on the line a note that would look like this. Okay? On a space like that. See, we want to avoid going like this or like that. No good. That's F minus. So you want to draw the notes as cleanly as you can. Also, you guys want to avoid making the notes super kindergarten huge like that. No good. F minus. All right. Make them tight. Another thing is a lot of guys I've seen over the years make the notes like that. Can you read that? If you were in a studio and somebody had you a piece of music that had this written on it like that. How many of you could read that pretty good? Well, really super pro musicians could probably figure it out really quick, but look at that. That's kind of difficult to see, isn't it? It's like, ah, oh, what is that? All right. Don't do that. You know the grade F minus. Make the notes so you could read them like this. You know, it takes slightly longer, maybe a nanosecond longer right to make them so you can read them all right now when you get down to read the notes here 
you want to know that uh, the musicians are going to be able to play your piece of music. So what you have to do is you have to write the notes in a way that people can read them. So they're small. Usually uh, what I think is the, the note shouldn't be beyond the size of a space inside the line. So that's the size you want to go for. And you try to make them as clean as you can. Stems straight up and down. Okay. So when you write the notes, <clears throat> you start by making a small circle and you follow this angle. So you go like that. Some composers even turn the paper slightly like that. So they can do that. <clears throat> so you get this imaginary angle like that and the notes fit tightly into the line or the space. See what I'm saying? They fit tightly into the line or space. Okay, half notes and whole notes are hollow. So what you have to do is you write them like this. You want to go, here's a whole note. Right? Half note has a stem, right? Okay, now let's talk about stems for a second. If you have five lines, the middle line the B line on a treble clef <clears throat> is the general rule of which way you want to point the stem, the direction. So if the notes go below the middle line, let's color those in. If it's below that middle line, the notes are below, the stems go up. Okay? If the notes are above the middle line, the stems go down. The middle line can be either. There's The rule is uh, basically anything above the line goes down, anything below the line points up. The middle line can be either. However, there are a lot of composers who write music out and uh, what they do is they'll write a series of notes like this and you've got two line two notes above the line two notes above the line one on the line one below so sometimes they just couple them or group them together like that because they're trying to represent this as an idea of a phrase that has a contour so sometimes they break the rules and write them with a beam across all four notes going up and a beam going down. You could write that, actually you could write that just like this if you wanted to. You could write that like this. You could go, uh, same thing, right? And then do this here. You could write this like this if you wanted to. And then bring those down and then uh, bring these down and then this one this would be the only oddball you see how that works that'd be the only oddball right there because it's not above the line it's below the line but the stem is pointing down that's weird but sometimes music is written that way as it is sometimes it's written this way but the general rule is always uh, this rule here below the line Stems point up. Above the line, what? Stems point down, right? Are you guys with me on that? So that's a general rule for stems. Okay, the next thing is flags. If you want to write flags on notes, Flags indicate the timing of the note. Uh, a whole note gets four beats. A whole note with a stem gets two beats. In a common 4-4 time, it would. 
a whole no a, a quarter note is a solid note with a stem that gets one beat and an eighth note is a stem with a flag that gets one half a beat okay a sixteenth note a stem with two flags gets one quarter of a beat and a stem with three flags gets one eighth of a beat so what does that mean all right if you have this timing here one eighth per beat that means there's eight there's eight little notes per beat eight notes per beat this is called a this is called a 30 second note this is called a 16th note here this is called an eighth note this is called a quarter note okay so eight notes per beat is 30 second notes you could go further than that uh, if you want to have a note with four flags on it that's called a 64th note and that's one sixteenth of a beat we're not going to get into that right now because it's a very very fast timing for the most part we're going to talk about just some basic stuff here up to like sixteenth notes okay uh, for now this is a basic lesson for you guys i mean a lot of you guys this might be redundant for you but you know just click the mouse if you don't like it and if you if you get some value out of it you know you know you can post a comment or two but uh, anyway so this is how you make notes you got to make sure they're real clean now again we talked about don't make the notes all kindergarten like that no good f minus okay no good don't do it don't are you with me don't write them kindergartening it makes you look like what okay so anyway don't make the notes kindergartening you get f minus all right also don't make them all weird shaped like that i've seen musicians do that you look at them and you go uh, uh what, what is that on the page there did you did you like trying to cover up some coffee stains or something so don't do that no good f minus okay we use f minus because this week one of my students came in and told me he went and saw a punk rock band called f minus and he said they sucked so bad that they started a song in the middle of the song they stopped and had to start it over again on the gig f minus that was the name of the band so i thought it was so hysterical we're going to use f minus now as our as our as our teaching tool all right now we're going to talk about what we talked about flags we talked about notes let's talk about rests a rest is where you don't play the notes an eighth note rest you just make real simple like this down up that's a one eighth note rest a sixteenth note rest would be two of those right a quarter note rest is the opposite way it makes like a, a big sort of a three like that now well, these are handwritten notes if you see notation programs they write them out a little bit differently than this they, they print them a little differently and they're very more a little bit more complicated but guys that write rests and who hand write them always write them this way so rest uh, there's another rest that's called a half note rest uh, this is a quarter note rest this is a sixteenth note rest here and this is an eighth note rest okay now half note rest half note rest is above the line right and it gets two beats in general in four four time a whole note rest is below the line and it gets four beats and it's below the line now the way you remember that is a half note rest is above the line so it's lighter so above right 
the homo rest is heavier so it's below right lighter above heavier below see it weighs heavier now what you don't want to do is make your half note rests like this see that what is that that is F minus don't do that whole note rest heavier now I've seen rests where they want to block out a certain number of bars like if you got a bar here and you got a bar here and you got a piece of music and in between those two bars there's like you got to go uh, you got to wait out like say 12 bars these guys will put a rest real long like that right and what they'll do is they'll put 12 and then they'll put arrows going to the end of the bars which means you wait out 12 bars 12 counts of 4-4 four, four, 12 counts of 4 before you start playing again so that's the only time I've seen the longer rests um, so basically the whole no rest below the line just a little rectangle is all that is see that's it not this not this and I've seen guys do this what is that say it with me F minus don't do that am I making this clear to you guys you like my sense of humor all right F minus on that don't do that no good F minus that sucks. That's terrible. Don't do that. Are you guys listening to me? That's horrible. Don't do that. That's only okay if you're going to do you know, more than one bar, two bars, four bars, whatever, how many bars you want to rest out. You put a longer one. Don't scribble the rest like that. F minus. Don't do that. Okay, so basically when you make a rest, you put a square right below the line or a little square right above the line. Now you see how the square only occupies about half of the space half of the space there okay half that's the best way to do it you can make them a little bit longer than that if you want to sometimes it's easier to see when you're sight reading but not much just a little bit so you got to use something visual so basically what we're trying to force trying for here is to learn how to have some finesse in writing music not just scribbling crap on the paper expecting other musicians to be able to figure out what you mean the better your penmanship is, the better your compositions will look, and the, the better you know people will be able to play them a little bit better if they're re if they're reading them, you know, because they don't want to have to figure out what you're trying to explain by guessing and just wincing and squinting their eyes and going, kind of wonder what it is you intended. That is the opposite of productivity. Okay, now we're talking about notes on the staff. And of course, we've got the notes. We play, we, we, we make the notes at an angle, right? Like that. Just big enough to where they fill up the space or the line. If it's on the line, it's going to take up half of this space and half of this space on the outside of it, right? Not this. And definitely not this kindergarten crap. You know how much I see this one? Every day. People write notes like this. You go, dude, is this a geology class, man? Because that looks like a crater. What's the what's the grade on this one, guys? You got it. Say it with me. F minus. No good. No good. Don't do it. All right. So we got the notes there. All right. The stems, the flags, the rests. Okay. Now the treble clef. Treble clef over here. Uh, there's a couple ways, uh, two or three different ways you could write the treble clef. Okay. Um, one of the common ways to do it is start below the line here. I'll do this one. Start below the line here and come up. Come back, make a loop on on the F line. Come around the G line and make a curly cue around the G line. That's when we actually make it a little straighter. That's a common way to do it. 
A lot of books teach that way. A lot of methods teach this way to do it. So you just got to practice them like this every day to get it down. And then you got to make your own style with it. You know, I, I don't like this particular style myself. I do it a different way. The way I learned was from Dick Grove. My teacher was Dick Grove. He had a Dick Grove School of Music out in Studio City, California. And I was one of his main students out there. And the way Dick uh, used to teach us how to do this was straight line down, okay? And then come over to the left and bring it over to the right, make a loop on the F line, come around the G line, and then draw a supporting line at the bottom. So we did them like that for Dick Grove all the time. And he could do them both ways, but this is the way... Uh, there are, were several semesters of music calligraphy classes that were offered there that I took. And they use actually a different... They don't even use a pencil. They use a music calligraphy pen. And you can only get those from a specialized music supply house if you're a copyist or whatever, you can buy them. Uh, they're sort of like a fountain pen with a, with a, with a wider tip and they're flat. But uh, for now, we're just using pencil. Uh, if, you, if you use pen, you're going to have uh, a lot of mistakes that you're going to have to fix. And you can't really fix them too easily with pen. So we use pencil. Dick Grove always stressed to use a mechanical pencil. And I, and I know I'm, I'm being blasphemous to, to, to Dick because I'm using a regular unsharpened Staples number 2 pencil. And uh, the only reason I'm not sharpening it right now is because I don't want to hear that sound in, in this videotape. This, this video on, on, on the screen here. Okay, so we're going to make a triple clef down, over to the left, to the right, make a loop on the F line, come around the G line, supporting bracket. Let's do it again. Down, over to the left, over to the right, around the G line, supporting bracket. Again, down, over to the left, loop over to the right, cross the F line, around the G line. Now notice this line is at an angle too. It's not flat. It's not this. It's this. You getting it? All right, so again, you gotta practice these just like when you were in elementary school, your cursive handwriting. They had to practice, you had to practice, you know, remember that in elementary school? Where you wanna go A, B, C, D, E. Remember all this? Can't even do it. We had to do that a bazillion times in elementary school, didn't we? Um, so, you know, you got to practice your penmanship. Uh, I've always been sort of blessed with sort of good control over my pencil because uh, when I was a young kid, uh, I used to draw a lot when I was a young kid, and then uh, my uncle was an artist, and he had a little game and he played with me that he would draw something on a piece of paper then he'd give me the paper and I'd draw something else and add to it and he'd add something to it and I'd add to it back so and he taught me to hold the pen and then my father was uh, his profession uh, originally was trumpet but then he uh, fell out of music and uh, his minor in college was architecture so he became a draftsman working for Lloyd Wright and I don't know if anybody's heard of Frank Lloyd Wright but Lloyd Wright was his son and he had a really very incredible way that he wrote letters. I mean, he used the architectural type of fonts when he'd write. Like that. And he taught me that when I was probably six, seven years old, maybe. And I loved it. I always liked to watch him look at his handwriting because it was so engineering precise. So I developed that over the years myself. Uh, and the cursive handwriting, uh, I just learned in elementary school. But, you know, I always try to, you know, do the best at it. I see a lot of kids these days, they, they, they hold pens funny. They hold their pen, you know, like this, you know. You know, they, they hold their, their pencils like that. Uh, good penmanship requires that you have a, have a really nice grip on the pen like that. So you want to really support it, right? So you got to work on that. Okay, so back to the treble clef here. We're going to write some more treble clefs, okay? And we go down to the left, over to the right, cross the F line, and around the G, okay? 
I want you guys to download some of this music paper off my website and try practicing some of these with your pencil. So you get pretty fluent at it where you can do it somewhat quickly, you know. And they're not all going to be perfect, you know. If you're all perfect all the time, you need to get a job as a, as a music copyist because those guys can copy music really fast and do it all accurately. But anyway, that's a dwindling field due to uh, Finale and Sibelius and Notion and a couple of others that are out there now. Uh, I think the most popular one is getting to be some Sibelius. I don't know. Uh, I have both, and they all have uh, their pluses and minuses as far as uh, features and drawbacks. So you kind of got to use both. I, I know Finale is really good for publishing. But Sibelius is really good for audio. If you write music and you want to hear it back, it's a much better sounding. Uses the samples, whereas the instead of the uh, samples finale uses the uh, little cheesy synthesizer sounds inside the software. Anyway, they they they're supposed to be able to play VST instruments, but I think the engine in Finale was written a long time ago before they had all this uh, VST stuff, and they haven't really revamped it from scratch. They got to start over with assembly language and rewrite the whole machine because they're just adding to the same machine they've always had with all the updates and the sound is still an issue and there's all kinds of workarounds they offer to you but Sibelius I think started from scratch when this VST was already out so I think they have a much better handle on VST sounds but their interface is not like desktop publishing it doesn't work like a computer at all Finale works more like PageMaker or any kind of desktop publishing program that you're used to where Sibelius, you know, you input notes by hitting the letters on the keyboard, hit a letter, letter key A, letter key B, C, D, and you click, you can click the mouse or enter them on your keyboard, but uh, the, I don't think the interface is designed around a computer style hacker based interface, whereas Finale is more like a programmer came up with the uh, interface based on existing desktop publishing programs that were all out there. So for me, that's a little more comfortable to use. I use Finale a lot, and then Sibelius I'm, I'm working on. Uh, Sibelius is more popular nowadays, I guess, so I'm working on it a lot to learn it. But you guys could pick up those programs. Uh, a cheap program that's about just about as good as Sibelius, for the most part, is this little brother of Sibelius, is uh, the, the, the scaled down version of Sibelius, and then they even have a guitar uh, one that's called G7. Those are similar to Sibelius, they don't have quite all the features, but for what you guys want to do, those are fine, and they're, they're both of them are under a hundred bucks, so you could get those a much easier than you can the full blown Sibelius. I believe the cheapest way you can get the full blown Sibelius is the academic version, and I think it's like two fifty. Uh, if you already own another program like a cross, like a Finale or something, you can cross grade uh, for like one fifty, but you have to send them the disc for your from your old program or the manual, I think or something like that, four, pa four pages out of the manual or something like that to cross-grade. So, you know, I avoid the cross-grade. But anyway, here we go. We're going to talk about the treble clef now. Let's talk about the bass clef. The bass clef, you just goes around this line here, the F line. Now, the, the bass clef has different notes than the treble clef. If you are on the treble clef, the notes are E, F, G, A, B, C, D, and E, and one more F, right? Okay. And the bass clef is different. This is the treble clef. I see there's a small one. The bass clef is different. The notes are different. Here's the bass clef. And the notes are G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then A. So you G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. They're different notes than the treble clef, and that's because uh, the piano, usually the left hand plays the bass clef and the right hand plays the treble clef. So the, the, the bass clef is made by taking this line and curving it around the F line that's the F line right there and then on the F line you put a dot above it and a dot below it like that so basically the way most uh, calligraphy classes tell you is you start on the middle line bring a curve around and go just below the clef 
just below the staff. So we start here, start here, curve around below the below the staff. Start here, curve around below the staff. Now a lot of guys don't start in the middle line. They start here on the F line and curve around, go, and then two dots and then below the staff. A lot of guys start in the F line and don't go, don't go below the staff. There's a lot of ways to do it. You guys got to be comfortable with the way you do it, and it's got to look good. Um, a big no-no is a don't don't just make it big like that. I mean, some some people do, but generally it's not acceptable. Okay, so we're gonna do that one. We're gonna give that a, a C minus on that one. It's okay, but no, don't. Please, okay. So treble clef and bass clef. All right, now next thing is uh, time signatures. Okay, time signatures, when you're in a studio, uh, tell you what timing the music is going to occur in, right? So uh, a lot of classical music, a lot of bo music in books, the, the time signature is written like this, right? Okay. And, you know, not at an angle. No. F minus. No, that's an F plus, sorry. Okay. The time signature is written four, four like that. Now you see it like that; it's pretty small. Um, what I've seen a lot, and what they teach at Dick Grove, and what they teach at Berkeley, and a lot of places, is when you're writing charts for a studio where they're going to record. You know, you don't want the musicians to figure out or squint or wince or, you know, whatever. Some guy may have forgot his contacts that day. So you make the as big as you can. You can go four, four like that. I've seen big band charts. Uh, you know, Gordon Goodwin, you know, Sammy Nestico charts, this big band charts, so the tre treble and bass clef, they put the treble clef here, and bass clef here, and then the time signature, they won't put two time signatures, they'll put one humongous, gigantous one right there. Why? So you can see it from, a, like you're sitting there on stage and you look at it, you know, that's 4-4, four, four. you know, or 2-4. Three, four. Okay. Another thing is when you're making a three, uh, the lines on the staff are going horizontal like that, right? So what you want to do is avoid trying to make a horizontal line on the staff because sometimes that might be hard to see. The best way is to make a line slightly going at an angle to the staff. You follow me? So it crosses over the line, so you can see it better than if it's just a straight line like that on the staff. Can you even see that? That's the same thickness line I just drew. So you make a four. Maybe now you can see it. Yeah, I think you can see it now. Same rule here. If you're making a three, you don't do that. You want to go like this. That's about as close as to the line you want to get. Okay, so time signatures, you put your time signature in over here. I like to make them real big. You know, that's what I was taught by Dick Grove. It makes sense to me. When I've been in studios uh, and I had to read charts, uh, I mean, sometimes these guys will uh, go to extremes, you know. Like, I've seen uh, Gordon Goodwin, you know, write charts out like that, right? You know, gigundous size, right? Because you're in the studio, the clock's ticking, studio charges by the hour. You don't want any musicians to make any mistakes because they got to accidentally, they got to jump through some extra mental steps to figure out what's going on. So you got to make these time signatures big enough to see them. So that means don't do this. Okay, that's it works. It works for your, you know, class, your junior college class where you're writing out classical music. And classical 16th century harmony lessons. I mean, little 4 4 like that works. But in the real world of guys who are playing gigs, please, guys, make them huge. Do it for me, if, if nothing else, because this is what helps the other guys read the chart and know what time it is. Sometimes these complicated fusion charts will go 4 4 for X amount of bars, then it'll drop to, uh, you know, a 7 bar, you know, then it'll go to 5. 
You see what I'm saying? So you got to have these hu human super Superman cues, these huge cues for the musicians to see on the chart. They got to change timing right there. You don't want you don't want this little itty bitty like that. You know, you can't even see it. I mean, if you're standing a couple feet away from that, it's 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 like not very easily detectable, right? If you just back off two feet, I think you're screwed. You know, because you can't see it very well. And a lot of these gigs. These guys have have charts that are on music stands, and they're outdoor gigs, so the music stand's about two feet away from them, you know? And uh, it's hard to see, you know, timing like that. But these big-time signatures, no mistaking it, right? Uh, sometimes even guys use different colors, you know, to, to make it stand out, or highlight it in yellow, you know? Uh, that's for, like, playing gigs, you know? And uh, Like, a lot of gigs you'll play where the stage will be dimly lit, and you won't have any lighting to see the charts, so unless you brought some lamp that you can clip onto your music stand, you're looking at a very, very dark piece of paper, and you got to try to read it, you know, in the dark. And I've been on gigs like that, you know, not more than once, but more than a dozen times. And really, everybody who writes these charts with these huge time signatures is doing us a favor by doing it that way, because as musicians, we're under the gun. You know, we're on the stage, and we're playing, and there's a crowd out there, an audience there, they're looking at you, and they're. If you screw up, you know, your 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 butt is grass, right? Okay, so that's time signatures. Now, let's talk about key signatures. Key signatures. Now, if you have a key like a key of C, has no sharps or flats, right? So we just write this treble clef right here, and that is the key signature nothing right so then you just put a 4-4 four four here right that's a little small per my standards I would prefer you know like that now there's a lot of people that will probably argue with me but you know the guys who actually go out and have played reading gigs live know exactly what I'm talking about and you know there, there's the academic way to do it and then there's the Dick Grove way real world clock is ticking the studio is, you know, sixty to one hundred fifty dollars an hour, and they got to get this thing done by two o'clock because the FedEx truck is on the freeway right now to pick it up at three o'clock. Okay, you with me? That's Burbank, Hollywood, North Hollywood, Studio City. Those guys function on radical tight time schedules because it's the TV and movie industry out there, television commercials, radio stations, t TV stations. The whole film industry is in Hollywood, just over the hill, and then North Hollywood has get the carryover from the film industry as well as all the TV industry. So, it's a huge consciousness of fast, get things done fast, timing, get it done now. The FedEx trucks on the freeway; it's going to be here in one hour. You better have your stuff ready by then, otherwise we're taking your name out of the book permanently for life. The only thing you're able to do is go apply at 7-Eleven, and then when you get to 7-Eleven. Even the manager there will tell you it's 7 11. That's where you're going to work if you screw this up. You guys understand me? So don't do that. Don't get F minus. No. All right. Now, let's talk about let's talk about uh, key signatures. Key of C. What is it? No sharps or flats, so we just do the treble clef, and then we put our time signature in. A little small by my standards, but I'm trying to compress this into a little video here. Okay, what key has one sharp? Do you guys know? It's the key of G. So we write our treble clef, All right? Now, in the key of G, do you guys know which note is sharped? Well, that's another video, but I'll tell you real quick. It's the note F sharp. So. The F's in the key of G, here's the key of G, right? The F's, all the F's in the key of G are sharped. So we put that in the key signature. The F line gets the sharp. Okay? Now, let's take a look at sharps. Sharps are written like a little tic-tac-toe sign on a slight angle. Okay? It is not this crosshatch. No. F minus. Don't do that. It's not this. No. 
No. Okay. Shake your head. No. Okay, good. Now, we want to do this. Two straight lines down, one higher than the other. Then, two lines at an angle, even with each other. Ah, no one ever explains how to write sharps, do they? That's because they don't know, and they never studied it, and they never took calligraphy, and they never went to Dick Grove or Berkeley or any of the great schools, North Texas State, you know, MI, you know, Music Tech in Minnesota, all these great schools, you know, uh, Eastman School of Music, of course, the mighty Juilliard. They teach that stuff in calligraphy classes there. And a lot of the theory teachers, these guys I call them, uh, to, what I consider these guys to be in what I call an academic bubble, where they are 200 IQ professors with a 200 IQ, and they automatically assume everybody else has a 200 IQ, and they don't go over stuff like this because they assume you already know. Okay, but that's far from the case with a lot of you guys. And that's why I'm going over this stuff, because I know there's a whole horde of millions of guys out there who just missed all the basic basics and the schools don't really cover it that well I was lucky that Dick Grove made sure that you knew this stuff otherwise you were out of the car you were you were laughed at you were ridiculed and he told you you suck what are you gonna do about it you know he made he he, he intimidated you and humiliated you till you got to the point where you realized Man, I know nothing. I need to start over from scratch. And that's what these are about. you got to be willing to say, okay, well, I don't know some of this stuff, so let me look at this again. All right, so the, the sharps are written like this. Okay? Now, in a sharp, they go on the liner space. And whatever note you want to sharp goes inside that little tic-tac-toe sign, inside there. Okay, so if the note, if the line is F right here, and you want to sharp the F, you put the sharp so the F line goes through the middle of the sharp. Okay, if it's on a space, you put the line or the space in between in the middle of the sharp. Okay, so F sharp and C sharp will look like this F sharp and C sharp right here. So the F line right here is going through the middle of that sharp and the C line right here is going through the middle of that sharp. That's F sharp and C sharp. Okay, the bass clef here's the F line right here so F sharp and C sharp like that. All right, that's the key of what, you guys, you know? Well, for those of you who know, that's the key of D major, right? And what's the relative minor key? Do you guys know? B minor. That's a whole other video, so stay tuned for that later on. But just for the general record, you know, you guys, that's a D major key. D major, B minor. Okay, now, um, sharps. And now flats. Flats are just, a, uh, looks like a small letter B. It's not... A letter B, but it's a line straight down, came up like a clover, like that. Like if you were to draw a four leaf clover, that would be one of the leaves there, right? So straight down, come up and make a clover. It is not this. And for sure, it is not this. It is not B. No. You guys know already that the grade for that is F minus. F minus. If you do this, if you make a flat like this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it really clear to you guys. Even more than that, if you make a flat like that, F minus, dudes. Epic fail. No good. So, what you want to do is draw the line straight down and make a clover. Now, the notes that you want to sharp. Or flat. I mean, in the, in the flats, you want to flat the note. So, the flat note, the line of the space go right through the middle of the note right there. So here's what you do. You make a flat right on the line. So the line goes through it. 
So two flats, B flat and E flat, would look like that. Right? And you got to practice them too, just like anything else. Just keep working it. Every day, get out your music paper. Download the free sheets of music on my website. Go to the Blackboard, download them. They're all free. You just print them out on your printer. You know? And then... Practice writing them. Okay, a double flat is a two flat is a note flatted twice, and that's just two next to each other, like that. So that's a double flat. Okay, now a double sharp. Here's a sharp. That's F sharp, right? Here's C sharp right here, right? C double sharp. Double sharp is an X with the center point of the X right on the space of the line and two dots. So double sharp looks like this. Um, a lot of times, uh, if people are using word processors, they don't have this character easy available, so uh, they just do an X, right? So C, X, sometimes in word processors is C double sharp. In re writing music, it's C with X with the two dots. Okay. So that's a double sharp. That means sharp to know twice. So we got sharps, flats, and double sharps, key signatures, and time signatures, okay? Time signatures uh, have another aspect to them. Uh, if you're writing a time signature, there are certain time signatures that are used all the time. For example, 4-4, four, four, uh, that is called common time. So they just put a C there for common time. Uh, back in the old days, 2-4 was a very popular time signature, and that was half of 4-4, four, four, so it would be called cut time, so that you'd have C with a line like that. And you've seen cut time, that's 2-4, okay? 3-4 time is popular, and then 7-4, uh, all the numbers, 2-4-4-4-5-4-5-8-6-8. Uh, now, I like 6-8 I like a lot. 6-8, you know, I like to write it real big like that so you see exactly, you know, what's going on in a piece of music. You know, big, huge time signatures, okay? So time signatures, key signatures. Now, also, you guys, uh, what you should do is uh, download a lot of music and look at it. Um, there's a really good website that is 15 euros per lifetime membership, not just per year. It's 15 euros per lifetime. And if you pay with PayPal or something like that, they do the conversion for you. It might be like 16 or $17. But it's called kunstderfuge.com. And that's like this. Kunstderfuge. Or kunstderfuge.com. And on that website is about 15 million pieces of classical and romantic sheet music which has an incredible wealth of information in it and guitar pieces, flute pieces, everything. Uh, all downloadable as PDF files. And they have also about that many MIDI files. So you can download those and hear the way they sound in the computer. If you have a program like Sibelius or Finale or Notion, you can download the MIDI files and load them into those programs. And then that will generate the sheet music from the MIDI file. And you could print them out and hear them there from there. So. That's a very highly recommended website. You guys should go there, join uh, 15 euros, unlimited PDF files of classical music, flute, guitar, piano, everything I've ever seen is on that website. All the basically public domain stuff from over 50 years ago is on that website. And I think it's one of the best websites. It's used a lot in universities. Uh, that's the best place to go to, to get uh, sheet music. The, the cost per sheet music is the best ratio. I mean, 15 euros for lifetime membership. And then uh, you just print that stuff out, you know, and you can study it. And you can play the guitar pieces and you can study the sheet music. Uh, to, to, to do a lot of re reading music on the guitar requires a daily discipline. So you just got to work at it every day and uh, keep practicing all writing all these out and make sure that you make your note heads real neat and clean. 
your time signature is big, your rests real clean, uh, your, t your, your treble clef and your bass clef really clean and accurate. Always strive for the best, the best uh, accuracy and penmanship that you possibly can have in your writing music. That way the other musicians won't have a problem and you'll feel better about it too if it looks good, okay? Alright, for now this is Pepper Brown over and out.